And today we're speaking to... I'm Milton Lawson. I'm a comic book writer based out of Houston, Texas. And my newest uh, comic is Orson Welles' Warrior of the World. Okay, now, the title is pretty neat, but um, is this a big play on the fact that Orson Welles was the person that started the War of the Worlds and the whole radio drama and everything that's freaked everybody out? Yes, yes. In fact, um, the, the premise of the comic takes the original radio broadcast as its starting point, and it inverts the, the scenario in the following way. In, you know, the original context, it was a radio drama, and it was an intentional play, and it created this phenomenon, and people freaked out. What the comic book imagines is, well, what if it wasn't a drama? What if it was a real event that actually happened? Aliens really did in, invade, and Orson Welles was just there to narrate and report live on the events. Well, what happens next after that is Orson joins a secret underground agency. As one does. Protecting Earth from aliens. So he shoots movies during the day, shoots aliens at night. Now, that idea there sounds vaguely like part of the plot of the UFO series by Gary Anderson, where the main character, Straker, ran a movie studio. Okay. And they hid the organization underground, basically. They fought uh-huh. aliens, but they were a movie studio. Okay. So this okay. guy did the same thing. So okay. that's... that's, that's who is that? I, I'm not familiar with that. Uh, the guys that did Thunderbirds in Space 1999. Oh, okay. Show yeah. called, one season called UFO. It was a, like a spy agency versus UFOs. Okay. Okay. Gotcha. Gotcha. And the idea is just like you're talking about. They did movies during the day and fought aliens, basically. Oh, okay. So, wow. That is a neat because it's it's a, got a good pop culture connection there. That's a really great idea. So oh, well, thank you. Thank you. That is. Now, um, with the whole thing, with what he did, it turned into... Hysteria, and then you're taking the premise that this really happened, so he's reporting on it. Um, in a weird way, do you think that also kind of talks about how we take our media today now? Because there's people now that even if it's just somebody goofing around on TikTok, for example, mm-hmm. people believe it's serious. So, yeah, um, I believe that the the scenario has resonance with this day and age, and a number of people have shorthanded it by saying that like Orson Welles kind of invented fake news. <laughs> and um, how we consume our news, what we can trust on the radio, what's real, what's a uh, fict- fictionalization, um, I think uh, is is a very important topic we're currently going on. I'm sure, you know, all of us have uh, encountered some, like, micro variation of this. Like, uh, I'm a sports fan. Right. And there, there are all kinds of social media accounts that mimic – other social media accounts and try to like promote fake trades and you know some of you know my astro fan buddies will be like hey we just got so-and-so like no way yeah we did no we did and so we're willing we're in that milieu now and it's very confusing Hmm. um so is this a ongoing series a limited series uh how is this process so it's it's a self-contained limited series in uh in traditional comic terms, it would have ran about maybe uh, nine or ten issues worth of content. Right. The um, I've got the issue one right here, which is kind of the introductory chapter. And coming in September, we have the full graphic novel, which is 238 pages. Right. Um, eight chapters. <laughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> and it spans the breadth of Orson Welles' entire filmmaking career, basically. Like okay. from the moment of the War of the Worlds broadcast up until the moment of his death. So, right. So, uh, we'll have a couple of his intrigue movies and Rosebud and all that in between Fight and Aliens. Yes. He was a very busy man already, and I've given him some new things to do. And one of the things that I made sure that uh, we we tried our best to adhere to on this is the I. It's an alternate history, but it's an alternate history that has absolute fidelity to everything that we do currently know about Wells. So everything we do currently know about Wells actually happened. Just in the background, there was some of this alien stuff. Okay. So, um, so 
you incorporating that was that include like his TV appearances because for a while he was a semi regular on the D Martin roast. Right. So um, I won't go into specific details of everything that we touch upon, but I I think um, you'll get a little bit of recognition of that particular aspect of his his television persona. Oh, cool! That'd be neat to see how it's translated that way. Yeah. Are there any of the books you're working on? Or projects uh, you have? Yeah, so I'm I'm currently working on a number of different things. Um, I'm working on a uh, cyberpunk science fiction story called right. Splinter City. It's about Russian gangsters on a floating city in space, <laughs> and the cool. city like looks like a splinter is my, where it gets its title from. And the art on it is by this brilliant artist named Jacob Dudek. Um, I met him at a comic book convention a few years ago, and it's just Technology, violence, commerce in a compressed space, uh, lots of stylized visuals. It's a lot of fun. Sounds like it. And when you're doing these type of books, do you find that sometimes it's we're kind of trying to have a balance between making a statement, talking about certain issues, but making it still entertaining and and keeping people like, oh, I'm, I'm entertaining you. You know, I've got this going on back here, what I'm trying to say. Right. You're, I want you to be entertained first. Yes. Yes. Um, my very first foray in the comics at, at any kind of significant degree, I did a few shorts, but the first series I had was called Thompson Heller Detective Interstellar. And it was about a private detective that goes around the galaxy solving mysteries. But he specialized in mysteries that involve some sort of a moral component, some sort of controversy. Right. Um, and so he'll go to a planet and there, there will be some sort of uh, conflict between various values. Um, he brings his own uh, perspective to things. And um, I, I endeavored and hopefully succeeded in entertaining first. Right. Um, making you think maybe a little bit and having some resonance with current topics well, on the slide. Right, which is traditionally what comics did writers like yes. stan lee and denny o'neill yes it might seemed in some ways we might have a political scene here and there or conflict of interest but mainly they're telling you a story mm -hmm. just if, again going back to like what tolkien did with lord of the rings there's a very moral very like brotherhood and honor and that kind of stuff but in the main thing you're worried about how these guys can get this ring to a volcano right yeah and so okay um so um, what do you see with what you're doing, how things will play out and with small press people and the digital age where so much is going to not just print, but digital media right now? Right. I think we're in a very interesting in, uh, point that might even be an inflection point in the medium of comics, um, in the United States, especially because, um, we have a sort of aging demographic supporting, uh, local comic book shops, uh, supporting the standard Marvel, DC, big two superhero content. But the younger generation is devouring manga. And um, they are getting it at bookstores. They're getting it at libraries. They're getting it digitally. They're getting it illegally digitally. Um, and for example, very recently, one of the most successful moves DC Comics has made is they've reprinted a lot of their classic stories in a more manga-sized uh, form right. factor. Um, and apparently those are selling like hotcakes. And I just think the recognition of the form factor is drawing in a new audience that they may not have otherwise had. So I think the traditional structures of comics, independent press, all the way up to the big two, um, need to find a way to attract that audience. Now, do we meet them halfway in the form factor? Do we meet them even more than halfway and go towards some of the aesthetics of Japanese comics? Who knows? Mm -hmm. um, or do we uh, turn them into converts? Say, right. hey, you love this stuff. This is the same medium. It's just slightly different aesthetics. Um, you're going to love this stuff too. And I think... The answer to that question is not obvious. The answer to that question is before everyone in the industry, but it will be answered. 
I think. Right. And that that's going to determine the future of, of the industry. It's a very good point. Now, having you having said that, kind of circling back to something you said earlier, doing this number one issue, then going, finishing it up in a graphic novel or trade type format, did that kind of inform that decision to do it that way? The the publisher on this comic, they, they have, um, it's Scout Comics, they have actually recognize that as one option that really works uh, for certain books. And the uh, the idea is just that, you know, you don't have to invest all your money in a full trade, get to try it out first. If you like it, you don't have to wait every, you know, every month to get the next issue. And, you know, maybe you forget a month or you don't order it the right month. And so you get the full story for sure. Right. Um, And they've done a number of them this way. Um, and, um, you know, there are a lot of different ways to approach it. Right. Um, and, um, uh, whether people are doing comics on, uh, subscription models through their newsletters or other online formats, um, and then supplementing the digital version with the physical version with a higher price point. Right. That is succeeding a lot. <laughs> a lot of people crowdfunding is succeeding a lot. So right. like you bypass the traditional distribution market altogether, you go straight from the creator to the reader. Um, that's that's a very good uh, model for a lot of people as well, but it's also a very crowded model. Um, like specifically right now, there are a lot of people doing campaigns and I'm, I'm just sort of anecdotally hearing a lot of people saying the market's kind of flooded in that area right now. Right. So how all of these things play out um, I, I think with a lot of these sort of complicated sort of scenarios is the answer is always going to end up being a combination of all these elements, right. but finding how to tweak the knobs to get the perfect symphony is something that nobody's fully cracked yet. That's a good point. Now, um, last question, the way you're doing things self-contained or more of a set point on these books do you think that small press that is taking that idea of having self-contained stories instead of giant arcing storylines is a little bit of relief for crisis du jour, the big two like to do if they do so many series and, oh, no, we've got to reset. We've got to do this all over again. Mm-hmm. And it kind of puts you the reader into this unfortunate loop of, mm-hmm. well, I've got to keep up with, i got to put point A, then sub point C, B, 1, which produced as a variant cover on a Tuesday mm-hmm. just to understand what the story is. Yeah. I, I think that's definitely a factor. I I think in the small and medium press, a lot of it just has to do with finding your level of support out there, your right. level of readership. And <clears throat> there are a lot of people that go with a project that's like, hey, it's starting out with a four-issue thing. I could expand it to a 12-issue thing, 24-issue thing, maybe even a 100-issue thing if the support is out there. Right. Um, you know, I've I've... I've got that idea myself on a few of my different projects. So I think um, eyeing those different trajectories from the beginning at the conceptual phase right. is part of what you have to do now. Kind of like what Starlin did with Dreadstar or Magnolia did with Hellboy. They self-contained before they kept going. Yeah. Okay. Well, thank you for your time, Mr. Lawson. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thanks for having me.